Reading scientific papers. So what are your goals when you read a scientific paper? First is to identify the sections that contribute to the paper, to explore their content, and then for the purposes of this report to extract what you need so that you can write your own research paper. Most papers will have this kind of structure. They will be published in a particular journal. Journal uh, name may give you some idea of what kind of work they tend to publish. The title of the paper, which tells you the one sentence overview of the content of this paper. The authors, um, what their names are and where they work. Uh, the abstract, which is a summary of the work, and it's often a one paragraph summary, but it can be broken down into subsections depending on the journal. The introduction, which gives you background information and a rationale for the study. The methods, which tell you the, essentially the techniques that they use to write or to design the experiment to uh, analyze the data uh, and come to their conclusions. Uh, the results section, which takes the summary of the data and gives you a sense as to what they learned and uh, sometimes a little bit of what they think of what they learned and how it compares to other results, um, which then leads to a discussion of the impact of this result, the impact of the findings, and uh, the author's interpretation. This is always followed by a reference section, and the reference section is going to tell you all of the work that led up to this work and all of the work that the authors think relates to the content of their paper, uh, studies done by themselves and studies done by others. Now this example paper that I have for you here, the activation of human brown adipose tissue by a beta-3 adrenergic receptor agonist, has a slightly different structure. Let's go back, where they have combined the results and discussion section, so that instead of having separate sections for results and discussion, they have a combined results and discussion section. And this is not uncommon, just depends on the journal and how they choose to have their authors work. Let's go bit by bit. This article was published in the journal Cell Metabolism in January of 2015. This is the volume number. These are the pages uh, where you'll find the information. Cell Metabolism tells you th that that is a focal point for this particular journal. And so other p papers in this journal may be on similar topics. And so sometimes when you're searching a particular topic, you may want to look at several issues of a particular journal. The title of this work, which we've just talked about, the activation of human brown adipose tissue, um, is the one sentence outline or summary of what the work is about. The authors, and it gives you the names of the authors, um, usually in the order in which they contributed to the work. So the person who's the first author is many times the person who did the lion's share of the work, the bulk of the work. Um, and then these are additional contributors as you go through the list. And then the final contributors are often people who were more senior who uh, supported the work. Uh, maybe they wrote the grant for this project, maybe they gave the first author the assignment of doing this work, um, but the last author is usually the most senior person. Now something's different about this particular paper because when we look down here where it says correspondence, it gives the first author's um, name. And usually the most senior author, the one that you often find last, is the person who gets the uh, correspondence. In this case, it's the first author, and that may give you a clue that the first author may not be um, a junior author, may not be a graduate student or postdoctoral fellow who was leading the charge on the work, but it, it could be a, a senior person, um, or it could be someone for whom this was their project to the degree where 
everyone else is uh, concedes that they are the person who should do the uh, correspondence on this paper because they know it best, they know the work best, they know the whole project. So I do suggest that you um, pay attention to who's first author, pay attention to who is uh, the final author, and pay attention to who the correspondent should be um, submitted to because that can give you some clues if you want to find similar papers along the same vein which one of these people you might want to search their name in a database or if it was something that you were really interested in uh, who do you contact okay looking at the abstract. Abstract should be a distillation of the entire paper, which means it should include a background section, just like the introduction, a little bit of the methods and experimental approach so that you know how they um, chose to attack their problem, a statement of what they consider the most important results, and then a conclusion in the abstract. And this is one of the reasons why I was saying when you do your literature review, if you want to know am I going to read this paper or do I think it follows in the line of the research that I'm interested in pursuing, going through the abstract will give you a good idea whether or not this fits into your collection of papers that works for your report or whether it does not. Now, here I've divided through this abstract. This is the, this first statement up here gives you a bit of the background that increasing energy expenditure uh, through the activation of brown adipose tissue, potential uh, area for treating obesity and diabetes. This is because while white adipose tissue is typically uh, not very metabolically active, brown adipose tissue not only is metabolically active, but it generates heat. And if you can burn fat by activating brown adipose tissue, perhaps you can um, have people lose weight and lose uh, and, and get themselves in a metabolic profile that is non-diabetic um, and also uh, reduce their overall um, fat load. And they do a um, their methods are going to uh, now look at 200 milligrams of oral mirabegron, um, a beta-3 adrenergic receptor agonist. And they're going to study in the, the metabolism of the brown adipose tissue using um, a fluorinated deoxyglucose and positron emission tomography to track where this glucose goes and uh, whether or not it's being metabolized. They give you some results that the Mirabegron led to higher metabolic activity measured by the following the um, fluorinated glucose. They use male subjects and they come to the conclusion that this beta-3 agonist can stimulate brown adipose tissue thermogenesis and may be a promising treatment for metabolic disease. In the introduction you get more depth. So they start off with a statement on how the uh, obesity is such a big problem in our society um, and how increasing the activity of brown adipose tissue might be one way of combating it and then provides some rationale for why you might move forward. More of the rationale here in the introduction They've had some phase two trials using this kind of uh, class of agent, and they've increased uh, the resting metabolic metabolism. Um, however, they thought that there were some problems with the other studies, and so they decided to test this directly using uh, the approach that we've already just learned about through reading their abstract. They're going to use this new beta-3 agonist and see if it um, provides a better 
uh, mechanism for activating the brown adipose tissue than the other previous attempts. In the methods section, there are several things that are uh, important. Um, one, this is an FDA-approved trial. Two, they use 15 subjects and they used uh, cold-activated um, metabolism of the brown adipose tissue and then did the PET scanning after they'd ingested the uh, fluoro fluorinated glucose. Um, they also measured the drug concentration uh, in the plasma and um, something that's coming up, and I think I have a slide on this later, uh, in a lot of studies you'll see today uh, there are so-called supplemental experimental procedures or supplemental data. Um, often it's more information on the methods, more information on the data collection and analysis, more results, and, but it's not published in the body of the paper. It's usually just found on a website and if you click on the link to the supplemental procedures here, you get more information on the experiment. Don't neglect the supplemental information, information when you are reviewing papers because sometimes um, you can find some important results there. One of the most important things uh, when you are reviewing a method section is to look at how they describe their controls. Their experimental protocol should have a hypothesis. The hypothesis is often something like factor X con affects condition Y. So X affects Y and in the control, the authors should attempt to create an environment where they test everything other than that factor X. And so here in this diagram, I've I have all the things associated with X, but X is no longer there. And then you do the same test and see what the impact is on the system that you're studying, and in this case, Y, um, and if Y is unaffected when you have removed factor X and is affected when factor X is present, then you know that the, uh, what you've seen is due to that particular uh, component that was eliminated from the controls. This kind of control of the experiment can vary depending on what kind of experiment's being done. It includes essentially every step of the procedure minus the component being tested. Uh, in a surgical manipulation, it may include a surgery, which would be called a, a sham surgery, and then in the sham surgery, they would uh, anesthetize the animal, they would make the incisions, they would do everything except uh, the surgical intervention that would be done in order to make a change or affect a change in the subject, and then they would close the animal up and allow them to recover from anesthesia and recover from surgery, just like the animals under test. Um, you're probably more familiar with it in drug tests because of the use of placebos, um, essentially a, a medication or a, a substance that's given to the uh, test subject that uh, does not contain the active ingredient. In the results section, you're going to see the data that's been um, averaged, uh, statistically compared, um, tabulated, graphed, and it should give you a picture of what the results, what the experiments produced, the results that the experiments produced. You'll get comparisons of the experimental control group and the control group you'll find that they've done some statistics to look at the significance of any um, similarities that they found between, uh, say, two different um, groups of subjects, or perhaps the differences. Are, this, are, the, are the similarities similar? Are the differences similar? And graphs and tables that represent uh, the data that they collect. Here are um, PET scans from young men who were tested with this um, mirabegrone and the uh, dark areas represent areas with active metabolism. Um, you can see that there's some metabolism in the brain, uh, metabolism in the heart, uh, looks like in the liver, perhaps, uh, 
However, under the influence of the drug, you see that the subscapular fat has now become um, uh, active, along with some areas along the spine and probably here in the liver more activity as well. So there's talking about some perihepatic near the liver, perirenal near the kidneys, perisplenic near the spleen. They also, for each individual in this trial, give you um, a measure of the metabolic activity of the brown fat um, when they gave that subject a placebo and then they did the test or if they gave them a dose of the drug and did the test. And you can see in this particular um, graph that these test subjects don't all start at the same place. Um, and that's one of the issues that is sometimes comes up when you deal with human subjects is because of the variety in the human population. Um, it's harder to get a, a control where um, the observations are exactly the same and then there's also a larger range often in the result. And that's why in many cases an animal model provides you a more focused view of what the test, or in this case a drug, but uh, what the test will pr actually cause is because with an animal control, st with an animal study, a control study using animals, um, usually the animals are all genetically identical, the same age, they have exactly the same living environment, and it helps to reduce the variability in your subject pool. The discussion is where you try to interpret the results. Um, and so here, for compared to placebo, for all 12 subjects, uh, brown adipose tissue uh, glucose uptake was significantly higher after treatment, um, and metabolism was higher. And then the author's conclusions, they summarize, uh, or they uh, conclude that this uh, beta-3 uh, adrenergic receptor agonist uh, acutely stimulates brown adipose uh, thermogenesis and increases the resting uh, re the respiration rate, the resting metabolic respiration of that tissue. Um, and since it's already approved for a treatment of overactive bladder, that means it's already been proved safe to give to uh, human subjects that this might be a, a pharmaceutical that could have an additional um, use in the public domain, and that is to treat obesity by increasing metabolism. Well, after reading the discussion, one of the things that you might want to consider is do the results support their original hypothesis? Sometimes um, between the initial introduction of the hypothesis and the discussion of the data in the in the discussion section, uh, there's been a little drift, and uh, the authors may not make a strong tie of their results to their uh, hypothesis, but they should. They should always let you know how their data either supports or perhaps refutes their hypothesis. Um, which of the findings do they find most significant and how do they compare them to the results of other workers? Sometimes there's other published work that is very similar or um, is similar enough that it needs to be commented on, um, especially if it um, agrees, but even more importantly, when it disagrees. If someone else has done a similar experiment and come up with a different result, then they should be able to say, uh, hopefully why they believe their results instead of what was already published. Because people tend to want uh, their work to be viewed as successful, uh, you have to be careful occasionally that some scientists will oversell their results. And so uh, that's another question where uh, as an evaluator, when you read their work, you have to think, have they convinced me? Uh, or, or are their claims of success um, higher uh, than what I would believe based on my view of their data?
Another thing that's important is the use of models. And one of the reasons, it's kind of like the old saying that a picture is worth a thousand words. Sometimes a good model can help you to understand um, what the authors um, were trying to uh, convey. Now, in this case, we have very simple models where they're tracking um, inflammation and insulin resistance versus thermal stress and when the animals are so values when the animals are cold and colder than their uh, resting uh, metabolic temperature and then when they are at their resting metabolic temperature and then the influence of a high fat diet as well uh, in this model and so they would expect as the temperature to go up the inflammation should go up but in for this particular animal model they would expect the insulin resistance to be unchanged however um, in this other model, uh, they're similarly looking at two different temperature regimes and they still expect inflammation to go up, but they also expect indicators of atherosclerosis to go up on what's called a Western diet, which is just a variation on a high fat diet. Now this is a very schematic model. Um, here is a more in-depth model and it relates to the um, more directly to the paper that we were just looking at on the beta-adrenergic receptor agonist. And so here they're looking at um, the uptake of glucose into the fat cells. They're looking at the uh, activation of uh, triglyceride pools. They're looking at the production of free fatty acids, the uh, work of the mitochondria, and the production of heat. And also um, the stimulus of this uh, fat cell through a, a beta adrenergic receptor that is cold sensitive. A nerve that is cold sensitive then will activate this beta adrenergic receptor which then uh, contributes to this uh, metabolic uh, pattern inside the cell. So sometimes the models will be simple, sometimes they'll be more complex, but models uh, can be very useful in conveying information um, and uh, easier to interpret sometimes than the graphs and tables that the authors actually use. Now the reference section should give you a sense as to what other work uh, is relevant when thinking about this particular study and one of the other th values of the reference section or the bibliography um, is that as you're developing your research paper this semester, sometimes you will find papers that are cited uh, by a particular author that you can use too. You can add them to your reference list. They have information that you will find relevant. And so uh, you start off saying, okay, this is a good paper. I'd like to read it. And then you go, oh, from reading this paper, I've learned about two or three other papers that I'd like to add to my database so that I can extract information from them as well. So, our goals were to identify the sections that contribute to the paper, to explore the content provided in each section, and then to see how we can extract that information so that we can uh, use it for our own report or our own research. Here's that slide about the supplemental, supplemental information. Um, it can co contain a lot of different um, material. Additional methods, descriptions, calculations, uh, computer modeling, uh, statistical processing. Uh, many times there are additional figures that are relevant to the study and sometimes the supplemental figures are figures that you might like to uh, employ in your report even more than the ones that the authors chose. So don't overlook the supplemental information. That's all I have for this reading of scientific papers. I hope it's useful to you, and we'll be uh, setting up the remaining uh, re recordings as soon as possible.